this epilepticus uh, are seizures that will not stop, uh, not always uh, with convulsions. And what do we mean by seizures that do not stop? Uh, by that we mean seizure activity that lasts for five minutes or longer, or multiple seizures without a return to baseline. These patients are often intubated or at least peri-intubation, meaning their, you know, their airways are compromised and we have to watch them closely. They will hopefully be on continuous video EEG. We rely on our frontline staff to be the, the first line uh, detectors for seizure recurrence, both uh, clinical activity and with a, a gentle amount of training, you know, basic uh, EEG as well. And that includes nursing staff, residents, fellows, PAs, nurse practitioners, and, and attendings who are non-neurologists or non-epileptologists. Now, these patients will often be on multiple infusions. And the ultimate treatment for refractory status epilepticus, what we call birth suppression, is a therapy that can have many side effects, including risks of pneumonia, ileus, hypertension, and many other systemic problems. So how do seizures manifest? Well, I'm sure you guys have seen many of them. Uh, seizures can manifest as rhythmic jerking of one or multiple extremities or the face or rhythmic blinking on one side, eye fluttering, episodic fluctuations in mental status, staring or unresponsiveness with or without eye deviation. There's a pretty wide variety of clinical responses to status epilepticus. How do we classify it? Well, it's, it's classified per the International League Against Epilepsy, first as a condition resulting either from the failure of the mechanisms responsible for seizure termination or from the initiation of mechanisms which lead to abnormally prolonged seizures, and then classified upon four axes, semiology, etiology, EE correlates, and age. Semiology is divided into those categories with prominent motor symptoms, those without prominent motor symptoms, or an indeterminate state such as confusion with epileptiform EEG patterns. Etiology is defined based on known or symptomatic causes, which can be acute like a stroke or an intoxication or an infection due to remote causes such as a distant stroke, prior brain trauma, prior encephalitis or other brain infection, or from progressive causes such as brain tumors and neurodegenerative disorders. It can also come from well-defined electroclinical conditions such as Lennox-Gastel or absence, uh, or they can be from un unknown or cryptogenic causes. What do we mean by EEG correlates? Well, that refers to the location, the pattern, and the morphology of the discharges. Location, we talk about being either generalized, meaning over the whole brain, lateralized to one side or the other, bilaterally independent, meaning discharges happening on one side of the brain and independently on the other, or multifocal. The name of the pattern being a periodic discharge, a rhythmic delta activity, a spike wave or sharp wave discharge. And these are, I'll show some examples of later. And then we also will talk about morphology, how sharp the discharges are, how many phases they have, meaning how many times they cross the midline, their amplitude, and their polarity. And finally, they're defined based on their age. Neonatal seizures being age zero to 30 days, infant seizures one month to two years, childhood two to 12, and adolescent and adulthood 12 to 59, and elderly being greater than six years old. Now we'll talk a bit about the pathophysiology about, uh, of, uh, of status epilepticus. Why does a seizure sometimes not stop? Well, why seizures stop is not a perfectly understood uh, phenomenon. So our understanding of why they don't stop is certainly incomplete. Seizures can stop because of changes in single neurons within local neuronal networks and with larger brain-wide effects. In a single neuron, energy can be depleted. Ionic currents can be overstrained and those gradients lost to so the inability to pass on electrical currents. Within a local network, the local region can become acidotic, which will decrease NMDA receptor activity. The stimulatory neurotransmitter glutamate can be depleted or taken up by 
support cells called glia, which reduces the availability. And there's regulation of extracellular potassium also by glial support cells. Also local interneurons can inhibit synaptic signals via GABA activity. And then we have brain-wide control or hemispheric controls where subcortical networks can act to regulate cortical activity. For instance, when there's a seizure over the cortex on one side of the brain, that will activate the substantia nigra pars reticula. In turn, this will activate a negative feedback loop through the thalamus, the superior colliculus, and brainstem reticular activating system networks which will in turn inhibit cortical activity and can stop the seizures. So now we get back to the question of why do seizures not stop with all of these mechanisms in place? Well, within a single neuron, GABA receptors become internalized, especially in the synaptic region when there's activation by NMDA receptors and they become dependent upon calcium neuron. Elevated levels of intracellular chloride can also decrease the inhibitory effects of GABA activity. So as seizures occur, chloride is taken up within the cell and that will actually make the GABA uh, response more blunted. In local networks, uh, excitatory cells will actually see an increase in, in, in NMDA receptor expression. So as these cells activate more, they express more of those receptors which will lead to further activation of the cells. Prolonged excitation can then lead to neuronal cell death. It can significantly increase calcium influx during prolonged activity. And prolonged convulsive seizures can also cause physiologic compromise affecting the whole brain. We can get hypotension, hypoxia, acidosis. All of these things can contribute to general neuronal damage, mitochondrial and energy dysfunction, and even eventually to cell or even brain death and, and prolonged seizures that don't stop. So how do we work up status? First thing we need to do outside of those normal ABCs is the patient still seizing. If they're still seizing, we still have work to do. Do they have a history of epilepsy? Are they known to be on a medication that can cause seizures or reduce the seizure threshold? Do they take any intoxicating drugs do they have any history of alcohol abuse or withdrawals? We check basic labs to look for electrolyte dysfunction. We look for signs and symptoms of either systemic or CNS infection and decide whether or not they might need a lumbar puncture. And we do imaging. These patients will frequently just get a CT head in the, in the ER urgently or if they're admitted an urgent CT. And then once they're more stable, if we don't know what's causing it, we'll get an MRI on these patients. So again, first thing we need to do, stop the seizures. A delay in stopping the seizures means more refractory disease, more brain damage, and higher mortality. At the same time, we're addressing any known underlying causes. Do our basic labs reveal significant hyponatremia or hypoglycemia? If that's the case, we treat that. Is there a possible alcohol withdrawal? Well, give benzos right away. Delaying benzos in that situation is going to lead to more complications of delirium tremens and can increase risk of death. At the same time, we're also thinking about the likelihood of recurrence. Does the patient have a structural brain lesion? Do they have a brain infection, a history of epilepsy, and prior status epilepticus? So how do we stop the seizures? Our first line treatment, the vast majority of the time, are benzodiazepines, typically lorazepam, two to four milligrams IV. Uh, we consider a treatment dose in status epilepticus to be 0.1 milligrams per kilogram before we consider a first line benzo failure. So let's say you have a, you know, a 60 year old patient who weighs uh, 80 kilograms, you give them two milligrams of lorazepam and the seizures don't stop, you've undertreated that seizure. So you need to give a higher dose, give four milligrams IV immediately. If the seizures still don't stop, give another two to four milligrams IV lorazepam. And you're doing this you know, with a couple minute delay in between each dose. If we're not seeing improvement, we are at the same time ordering our secondary agents so that they can be delivered in a timely manner. Loading with their 
there are three drugs that have been shown uh, via trial uh, to be uh, equally effective in controlling uh, benzo refractory satis epilepticus. Those are levetiracetam, and that's a large 60 milligram per kilogram load. Then starting maintenance therapy, 500 to 200, 2000 milligrams twice a day. The load for levetiracetam will be up to 4.5 grams. So if they weigh you know, over uh, 75 kilograms, they're going to get only 4.5 grams. Phenytone is usually loaded as its analog phosphenytone at 20 milligrams per kilogram and then started on a maintenance dose of 100 milligrams three times daily. We we'll use phosphenytone because it is uh, less likely to cause acute hypotension and acute, uh, acute cardiac arrhythmias uh, because it is a prodrug. Uh, that is metabolized in the liver to the active form phenytone. And that pass through the liver takes time and decreases the risk of the cardiac suppressive effects that phenytone is known to have. When using phenytone, we're gonna target a trial level in these patients of 18 to 25 uncorrected. You may have uh, heard about correcting for albumin levels when, when dosing phenytone, but in the acute setting, we're not worried so much about the protein bound uh, drug. We're worried more about what's free and circulating. So we, we just target a total level. The third agent to use is propoic acid. And I apologize, this is a, an error. That should be 40 milligrams per kilogram, not 20 milligrams per kilogram. And then starting a maintenance dose of typically 500 milligrams three times a day targeting a level of 80 to 125. So why do I include these levels here? Well, if you are treating a patient and you are having refractory seizures that aren't stopping, you should be checking these levels along the way. So one or two hours, two hours to four hours after a load, check the level, make sure you're in that therapeutic range. If you're below it, you can add more. If patients remain refractory to uh, to the above therapy, um, they often will need to be intubated and started on propofol or midazolam. I, I apologize, I just need to text a colleague. So in treating refractory status, the typical drugs that use are propofol and midazolam. Propofol, is started at one to two milligram per kilogram load, repeated every three to five minutes until seizures stop. That's a, a lot of propofol. You know, the, the typical dose we use for intubation is somewhere between 50 and 100 milligrams or one milligram per kilogram. We're using, you know, one to two times that and repeating that every five minutes until seizures are under control. And then we're going to start drips at, at 50 to 150 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, the midazolam bolus would be 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, similar to what we do with lorazepam. And then starting a drip at 0.2 milligrams per kilogram per hour. Every five minutes, if seizures are not stopping, bolus another 0.1 milligrams per kilogram and increase the continuous infusion up to 2.9 milligrams per kilogram per hour. I've had patients that are on 200 plus milligrams of midazolam an hour to treat satis epilepticus. They're very high uh, rates, but they are shown to be safe uh, compared to the allowance of continued seizure. If seizures continue despite this, we'll typically go to a, a third agent, either ketamine or pentobarbital. If you're using pentobarbital, load with five to 20 milligrams per kilogram IV and start a maintenance dose, typically at one milligram per kilogram per hour, and then reload and go up as needed. We'll use short acting paralytics during intubation because we do not want seizures to stop because, of, sorry, convulsive activity to stop because of a paralytic and then the seizure activity to be undertreated. And you want these patients to get placed on EEG as soon as possible because convulsive status epilepticus can devolve into non-convulsive status epilepticus 
as it, as it progresses. Other concepts, as I mentioned earlier, we want to manage the ABCs, seizures impair airway protection, the treatments that we give reduce respiratory functions, medications that we, that we give can cause hypertension, can cause arrhythmia, uh, and at the same time, we need to look for these other underlying causes. Is there significant hyponatremia, hypoglycemia that should be corrected in an expedited fashion? Let's say there is significant hyponatremia. We don't want to go from you know, a sodium of 120 right to a sodium of 140. You only need to increase that, that sodium concentration by about four milliequivalents per liter. So if it's 110, get it to 114. Don't go higher than that. At the same time, we're going to be looking at other workup. We'll consider an MRI, lumbar puncture. We'll do toxicology panels if we haven't found you know, a good cause. We'll look at other things like LFTs, troponins, uh, coags, all these other things that, that can be uh, abnormal in seizure patients. Here's sort of the algorithm that we typically will use. Um, for refractory status epilepticus, so when patients have failed that first line, benzo and AED. First question, is the patient intubated? If they are intubated, start them on a continuous infusion of midazolam and propofol, and you can concomitantly add a second long-standing AED. If they're still seizing after that, change to another continuous infusion or add another continuous infusion. So if they're on midazolam already, consider switching to propofol or adding it. If they remain refractory, change to pentobarbital or add ketamine. So that notice that difference there. When patients are, are started on pentobarbital, we actually excuse me, stop the other sedatives that they're on because pentobarbital is such a strong sedative, it works by itself. And adding these other medications is just going to increase risk of side effects. Versus ketamine is an adjunctive therapy uh, to midazolam or propofol in the use of the stopping seizures. And then there are super refractory seizures that don't respond to our normal therapy. And we have to consider non pharmacological options ketogenic diets, vagal nerve stimulators, electroconvulsant therapy, and even sometimes surgery. Uh, in my uh, training, I've encountered uh, these situations maybe two or three times total over you know, the 10 years that I've been in neurology uh, training or practice. Um, so usually we don't get that far. Usually we find some underlying cause that we can treat or at least begin to manage. And we're able to get these patients off of continuous drips uh, eventually. And now we'll talk a bit about the continuous EEG monitoring. Uh, I put in video there, uh, parenthetically, we like to have video um, because we like to look for clinical correlations, uh, but it's not always available. It's a much more resource intensive process. So patients who have suspected seizures, either non-convulsive uh, seizures or non-convulsive status epilepticus, uh, these are very common, especially in critically ill patients upwards of 30% of patients in those settings. Uh, patients who have unexplained altered mental status, if we are monitoring for ischemia, if we want to monitor for levels of sedation, then we can use it for prognostication as well. Non-convulsive seizures are associated with secondary injury. We see increased intracranial pressures, increased edema and mass effect, changes in tissue oxygenation and changes in tissue metabolism. Non-convulsive seizures in status epilepticus are associated with increased mortality and worse neurologic outcomes. Rapid diagnosis and treatment may mitigate this, but we actually don't have the data to support that yet. And then EEG use in ICU patients, uh, patients at risk for non-convulsive uh, status and seizures can lead to changes in treatment for other conditions as well. Now I'm going to briefly show some examples of, of EEGs. Um, this is by no means a, a comprehensive training. It's just some examples. Uh, the picture that we see here, um, these sort of slowly undulating waves, they look pretty calm. 
This is just generalized slowing. These sharp patterns you see here correlate to the EKG, and that's just based off of where that, that uh, lead is currently being recorded. Focal slowing, we see on one side of the brain, faster activity, and on the other side of brain, slower undulating activity. Generalized periodic discharges. You see these discharges that are sort of sharp and stand out from the background and they happen repeatedly every, you know, in this patient, two times per second. And this is a non-epileptic pattern typically. You can have lateralized rhythmic delta activity. You see these slow waves here on the top and third down line. Those are lateralized rhythmic slowing over the left hemisphere. And we call it a rhythmic delta activity because this same slow wave is basically repeating itself over and over. And it's only happening on one side. This is a, uh, a pattern that is concerning for uh, increased risk of seizures. So if you see this uh, on a patient, you know, make sure the, the team knows about it. Make sure your, your attending knows about it. And uh, the, if, if the EEG uh, person who's reading does not know about it, uh, they will see it as soon as they, they open the, the record. This is an actual seizure. These green lines represent one second. And this activity, these sharp repeating discharges are occurring at about five times per second. So anytime we see a pattern that's over two and a half to three times per second, it is consistent with a seizure activity. And here's another example of a focal seizure that's coming just in this single area here. This is an example of an absan seizure. Um, and then finally, in uh, some places, we can utilize quantitative EEG. Um, and I know this is currently used at MSK. Um, this actually makes it a lot easier for bedside people to know what's going on. You know, the EEG reader epileptologist can identify a quantitative signature. We can print that out for you and put it next to the screen. And you can actually count for yourselves how many times those seizures are recurring. Now, this is probably over a four hour period. We see one, two, three, four, five, six seizures. As we increase the therapy, increase the, the medications for that patient, we wanna see if there's a response. Does it decrease the number of seizures per hour or not? Another, uh, another example of, of quantitative EEG and status, you see the same repeating pattern over and over. These are seizures that are happening intermittently uh, with lack of seizure activity in between. And we can use it to monitor for recurrence of seizures after uh, withdrawal of anesthetic therapy. So uh, in this uh, case here, we see that anesthesia was decreased at 1020 on day one. At 1040, we start seeing seizures recur, and then they go back into this continuous repeating pattern of seizures. That's it for my, uh, my, uh, my slides. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them.